So, uh, so this high affinity of microRNAs for specific cell types has a role in maintaining the cell type identity in, in, in the differentiated state. And, and then in 2002, the first link of uh, whenever there was a, a the regulation uh, at a cell level in a, in a disease such as cancer, and the, and the differential expression of microRNAs was established. Uh, this, actually, this was a, a milestone paper that was published in 2005. And what they did is they took several uh, tumor samples uh, at, at the tissue level. And they, just based on the microRNA expression, they asked a machine to cluster the, the tumors without telling the machine where, uh, what type of cancer they were. And as you can see here, these are all the, type, all the different types of cancer. And as you can see here, all the cancers that are of epithelial origin are clustered the same in, in, a, in a specific way. And all the samples, that, all the tumors that are also cancer intelligent tract are also clustered in the same way. So just by looking at uh, the sequences of these microRNAs, where do they come from? Just a machine was even better than a pathologist to figure out what type of tumor and where did they come from. But most importantly, in 2008, uh, Professor Munich Tewari, which is part of our advisor, discovered that they circulate in blood. Whenever there's this problem in the cells at the tissue level, they are breaking apart and they are releasing the microRNAs in the bloodstream. If you see microRNA one, as, as, as I was showing you, a, a, a hard microRNA circulating in the blood, it means there's, a, there's cells in the heart are, are breaking apart. MicroRNA 122, a liver microRNA, if you see it in blood, that means something is happening in your liver. So just to, to, to summarize this, there are three very special things about microRNA. They are highly stable, and they have a long half-life in blood in circulation. They are highly tissue specific, uh, therefore can be excellent biomarkers for organ damage. And because they are found in circulation, we can uh, detect them in a non-invasive way, just by a blood sample. The first thing we did in our company was obviously to test it on ourselves. Uh, so this is, this is five, five weeks in my life, uh, monitoring four different microRNAs. Here on the y-axis, you see uh, CT values of a qPCR, which is a method for amplification. The higher the number, the, the, mo the, the less present is there. So around 35 up is basically absence of microRNAs. The lower the number means present. So here, for example, microRNA 16, which is a red blood cells microRNA, is very present in my week first. microRNA 22, which is a liver, it's somehow present. And these two are practically, practically as absent in my life. And as, we go, as I go on with my life, the levels stay basically the same. But then on week number three, a friend asked me to, to go with him uh, for CrossFit. I know you heard about CrossFit, but it's a painful experience. <laughs> and, and my body reflected it too. You can see my, the, the cells of my heart and my muscles break, breaking apart and releasing the microRNAs in my bloodstream. I could feel that I was in pain, but my, my physiology, my, my, my molecules were also reflecting that. I never went back to, to, to <laughs> CrossFit, and the levels of microRNA went back to normal again. So they reflect uh, in real time our physiology. To detect microRNAs today, you still require highly skilled scientists, expensive reagents, very complex protocols, and expensive machinery. So there's a lot of potential there, but we cannot we, we, it's still very difficult to tackle it. It's still very, it, it's not democratized. So what we, what we want to create, our vision, is a way that we can monitor our physiology, diagnose disease at the molecular level with a biomarker that is sensi uh, sensitive and specific, with a, simple, with a simple one milliliter of blood, and that you can do it in, a, in, a, in, in your doctor's office or perhaps eventually even in your house. Our first, the first application, the first clinical application we're targeting is cancer, uh, specifically <coughs> stomach cancer. Uh, one out of three people sitting here will be diagnosed with cancer. And of those, one, of, one out of four will die because of it. Uh, if we continue thinking about cancer in a reactive way instead of a preventive <coughs> way or detecting it early, those numbers will not change. They will continue increasing. So we need to, this is, for example, uh, the way to diagnose stomach cancer. It's an endoscopy. And it hasn't changed in, since 1965 when, it, when endoscopy was introduced in the clinical setting. So if you had a stomach ache 
uh, a, a chronic stomach ache uh, in 1965 or in 2016, the way to discard or to detect the stomach cancer is exactly the same. And the outcome is uh, most likely also exactly the same. Uh, is a, is a sec this particular cancer is the second deadliest cancer in the world. And uh, out of one million people that are diagnosed, 80% don't, don't live more than 18 months. So that's why we decided to focus on this uh, cancer first. And the way, the way that we, the, the, the way the platform that, that, that we developed, the way that it works, it has three, three different steps. The first step is collecting the sample, uh, which, is a, which is a blood sample, one milliliter of blood from the vein, and, and then uh, mixing it with our reaction, a chemistry that we created. Uh, this chemistry, the, the, the main milestone that we created here is that it can, it can react in very simple conditions, just one stable temperature. You don't need to have a, a very complex protocol for this. And that whenever there's a specific microarray we're looking for presence, present there, uh, it will shine with UV light. So here you can see with your naked eye, each of, imagine that each of these wells is looking for a different microRNA, and each of these wells have a, it's, it's, uh, has a specific track when you combine the sample of the individual, and if it shines after the reaction, it will, it will shine with these UV lights. And the way it looks uh, data-wise, it, it creates exponential. Uh, on the y-axis, you, you see Florence's units. On the x-axis, you see time. And the sooner it shines, and also how, how many units it shines, we can also figure out uh, how much uh, of that specific microRNA you have. Uh, the second thing we did to fix the, 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 the need of, a skill, of highly skilled scientists, it's a, 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 a platform uh, called, based, called digital, uh, te a platform based on a technology called digital microfluidics, uh, which is basically you have a cartridge like this one. So this is a PCB board, it's like the size of your phone. And basically what, what it has is what you see here in yellow, it's, it's uh, electrodes, just an array of electrodes. When you connect, when you put that cartridge inside an instrument, it's basically creating, a, applying voltage to a specific electrode. And you have the, you have the PCB, you have a, a plastic cover. That plastic cover is connected to ground. And that space, that microspace that is between the PCB and the plastic, uh, it's, sandwich, it's sandwiching the, the droplet, the, the sample and the reagents. And when you apply potential, it creates a capacitance force that can make the, uh, the droplets and the reaction move. So that way, you, the, all you need to do is literally put the sample, put the cartridge inside the instrument, and automatically with software, we can, we can move and dispense unique, specific, and very, very accurate amounts of, of a specific reagent. We can mix them. We can move them to the reaction zones. So literally, the user doesn't need to, ne doesn't need to, to have any, 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 any skill just, just to input a, an inlet of, of plasma. In, in all this technology, uh, we have uh, 28 different patents in 11 different families. Um, and finally, and I will leave my colleague Antonio to talk to you about more about it, it's, it's the, the data analysis part. And how we're using data, not only to analyze our experiments, but also to understand what is already an input, all, all, what is already out there, what other labs have been, have been working on. great biomarkers and we have great technology to detect it. Uh, and now the last piece of it is we have to build predictive models that diagnose the disease that we are interested in. Um, to do that, we need to build these models. And here we have our machine learning machine uh, that we use to build those models. Uh, what, we, what I'm trying to signify here is basically we need to collect data. We need co to collect data about the patient. That means both the clinical history, contextual information, and microRNA profiles of a big cohort so that we can actually run. Uh, microRNAs are a uh, nascent field, so there's a lot of controversy and there's not enough data, and this data is actually very expensive to collect. So the other thing that we do in the other side of the machine is try to collect primes. So everything that is known about, known about microRNAs, we try to use to accelerate our memory. Right? Uh, in these trials, uh, I'm going to be talking about the first two, so publications and uh, just validated databases in which scientists have painstakingly collected all findings that they've seen in the lab so that uh, we can leverage later. 
And then other known facts about microRNAs, such as tissue specificity that Jorge was talking about. So let's just start uh, with the literature and the validated databases. Now, if you look at the literature, and this is querying PubMed, which is a repository of uh, biomedical literature available uh, for everybody. If you just look at the number of publications uh, regarding microRNAs, so if you look at tissue microRNAs, uh, they were for the first time detected in 2000. So what you see there is that the triangles, which is like number of uh, publications per year uh, about tissue microRNAs, have been actually going exponentially. That uh, axis is logarithmic. And it's kind of plateauing at this point at 2,000 papers a year. Uh, and when you look at circulating microRNAs, which is what we are interested in, uh, microRNAs in blood, they were first really detected in 2008 uh, and also linked to cancer. And they are also growing actually above uh, exponentially. That's a blessing in that we have a lot of information, but it's also a curse uh, because trying to read this information would take several lifetimes. Right? The way that you typically do this is you go to PubMed, uh, you look for whatever it is that you are interested in, in this case, microRNA 34 and breast cancer. You'll have a lot of results, scroll through them until you find something that actually has to do with what you are interested in. Try to retrieve that paper. If you're lucky, that paper will pertain to the open access subset so that it's not behind a paywall and you don't have to pay to read the paper. Um, and then once you actually do that and go through the paper, eventually uh, you'll find sorry, you'll find something that you didn't know. Right? In this case, what it's saying is that a specific gene called BADS that uh, inhibits breast cancer by upregulating microRNA 34. So that you have a link between a gene and a disease through a microRNA, uh, and in your head you kind of populate this graph of knowledge uh, in which that uh, is actually having, has something to do with breast cancer because of microRNA 34. Now the problem is that this literature is growing exponentially, right? So what we tried to do uh, was replicate this cycle of searching, choosing, retrieving, reading, and finally learning at scale. So we tried to remove the choosing part and said, what about if we just read all PubMed together, right? We didn't have time to do that, so we hired an elephant to do it. Um, and using Hadoop, which is a distributed platform, we could um, actually read all the open access subset uh, comprising you know, more than a million articles and counting actually these are figures from last year, uh, total of like 200 million sentences and 111 million concept mentions. And I'll tell you exactly how that looks like. So we retrieved those papers. Uh, we used what is the standard NLP to break them down in specific sentences. Uh, and we know where those sentences are, which paper it is, and so on. Um, and then we do named entity recognition to try to figure out what's a gene in that sentence, in this case that, what's a condition, breast cancer, and what's a microRNA, right? And at this point, we already have like some kind of link between the three entities because they are co-referenced in the same sentence. But we still don't know what those sentences mean. And that's where, the, where we leverage this uh, validated data set. Uh, so what I mean by that we still don't know what the relationship is, is that you can have, for example, a microRNA and a gene in the same sentence because the uh, paper actually found uh, some relationship between them, or because it did not found, find uh, a relationship between them. Uh, what we do is we get those sentences and we try to match them with our validated set of interactions so that we end up uh, in what's called a distance supervision uh, classification uh, scheme. We end up with a labeled set of sentences that are hopefully in average right. right? So not all the sentences that name uh, a microRNA and a disease that are related will actually talk about a real relationship because the, because the literature doesn't really 100% agree, but the hope is that directionally, most of them will talk about a positive relationship. Um, we use that data set to learn, uh, uh, to train a predictive model on just relationship types, and we've been working at this 
for a bit, uh, actually, as part of a project with uh, Microsoft, just trying training models that get sentences and classify them in, say, expressing a relationship or not. And once we have those, uh, those labels for the relationships, we can actually populate a graph, right? So we are, we are in a Neo4j conference, so you need to see something like this. Uh, <laughs> so, we have, so we have different nodes, which are either micronase, genes, or diseases. We have relationships that we have uh, extracted from the literature. Now, if we go to Cypher and try to do a query, say, on like a specific micronase, what we see is still not very useful. Uh, so we decided to build to go one step further and build a, a UI uh, that is actually publicly available at loom.bio that helps you navigate this. So when you open loom.bio, uh, what you see is a representation of diseases, micronase, and genes, color-coded. You can look for uh, any disease that you care about. Um, and in this case, we are looking at esophageal neoplasms. And what you would see is different micronase that are linked to that disease. If you click on one of those microRNAs, we'll show you the sentence that we found relating both. And you can even click on any of those and they go to the actual paper. Right? If you do the same with a microRNA, you have on one side uh, the genes, on the other side uh, the conditions, and you can still do this. So this, this helped us a lot in like, trying to find the specific microRNAs that were related in our case with uh, gastric cancer. Uh, but in general, it has helped us establish a relationship with the scientific community. People find a lot of value in going first for, for the, to the finding that you actually want to look at, and then finally pull the paper instead of the other way around. It seems to be a little bit more efficient. Um, in the back end, what we are doing is, as I said, we are using Hadoop and Hive uh, to basically collect and organize all this information. We are doing some natural language processing in breaking those sentences, doing the name and the recognition and so on. We have a score that is the machine learning, machine learning model about how to classify those sentences. And finally, we store all this in a graph database uh, that we expose with Loom. On the other side of the machine learning machine, we have data, right? And this is not the data that will come from our patients, but the data that we are going to use to train the model. When we were um, looking at Loom, one of the things that was very clear is that there's not that much consensus in the literature about findings, and that's normal of a field that is uh, young. But this can also be ascribed to a specific, uh, uh, let's say, limitations of the, of, the, of the studies that are done. So when we looked at the number of subjects that were enrolled for uh, studies trying to link microRNAs with a specific disease, typically the cohorts are 50 or less, which is not enough for building a predictive model on microRNAs. Uh, and this translated in not that many validation studies. So there's a lot of discovery studies in which they, there's some finding reported, but then there's not a validation in which these findings are validated in a different cohort or in a different population and, and so on. And that's basically the main problem that is there with like microRNA uh, reports today. There's not, it's not that the, that the research is wrong. It's just that the design of the study, the data collection, this data that you are going to feed into the machine learning machine is biased in some way or is incomplete. So with that in mind, uh, we try to design a study for our application for stomach cancer. And we try to follow what are the guidelines of the FDA in trying to design one of these studies. So there's three things you have to do. One thing is analytic <coughs> validity, which means that you are measuring what you claim to be measuring. And that had to do with the platform that Jorge explained you. So we know that we can measure microRNAs in a specific and sensitive way. Uh, there's clinical validity, which means that these microRNAs are actually linked to the disease that you are trying to predict. And then there's clinical utility, which is that the output of your model has some consequence in either the prognosis or the therapy or the outcome of the patients that you are giving this number to, right? So for the clinical utility, so Jorge talked a bit about uh, stomach cancer. Stomach cancer is a, it's a huge problem. There's like around 1 million di new, di new diagnoses a year. 800,000 deaths a year. 
and the only there's no there's no other biomarker, uh, and the typical diagnostic test that you would be recommended if you have symptoms is an endoscopy. Out of the people refer refer for an endoscopy, only two percent of them will actually have gastric cancer, and that means that the endoscopy is overutilized, and the lines for endoscopy are huge, especially in countries where gastric cancer is prevalent, such as Latin America and Asia. We know that in Chile, some symptomatic patients wait until like as much as four years to actually get an endoscopy. So the diagnostic problem that we are trying to solve is let's try to clean those uh, endoscopy services so that more people that actually need it get it, right? So we want to do a screening test in which you first get the test and then you are referred to endoscopy if there's a need. So that's our clinical utility and then for the validity, we needed to establish that we can have a predictive model that takes microRNA profiles and it spits out probability of you having gastric cancer with uh, some generalization power, right? In order to do that, uh, we joined forces with the NIH and in particular with the National Cancer Institute as well as a uh, um, very well-known uh, eminence in the gastric cancer community, Dr. Corbalan, in Universidad Pontificia de Chile. And we define very clearly our inclusion criteria. That is, who is the people that actually are going to end up getting the test? Those that are referred to endoscopy. So only people that are symptomatic and that would go to the endoscopy get into the study. The distribution of the cohort is in size, is the biggest, the largest study of microanase and gastric cancer to date. Uh, we have 650 patients that were distributed across three different centers. So we have Latvia, Lithuania, and Chile, so different uh, genetics, different hospitals, different practitioners. Uh, the collection actually matters. This has to be pre-analytical, but basically we wanted fresh samples, so 2010 onwards. And then we, were, uh, we applied uh, the most strict way of training this model, so we held out half of these data sets and try to train our model and then validate it on the So we put all these on our machine learning machine uh, and ended up with a model that has an area under the curve of around 0 0.8, 0 0.78. Uh, what this plots is just the specificity versus sensitivity. Uh, and here you can decide to choose a threshold that is maximally useful for our study. In our case, we know that endoscopies are very specific, but not so sensitive. So we wanted a test, a screening test, that is very sensitive, but not so specific. The reason for that is that you don't really care that you have some false positives, because these people are going to be referred to endoscopy later. Right, so we try to maximize our accuracy for the prevalence and the application. And we were happy to see that the test performs well on Early, uh, on early subjects, so the plot in the center is just uh, our risk scores for, uh, first of all, to the, to the right for the control population, that is people not with gastric cancer, and they are uniformly lower than for those with cancer, but also the test predicts well early as well as later stages. And this is important because the people that we actually want to fish is these people with early, uh, with early <coughs> stages of cancer, in which actually the prognosis is much better. Uh, something I forgot to mention is that one of the reasons that gastric cancer is the third most mo mortal cancer is not because it's a bad cancer, it's because it's diagnosed very late. So if you can actually move the diagnosis from stage three and forward to stage one, you can greatly reduce the mortality of the cancer. And then finally, uh, looking at like the three different centers in which we were training this model, we see that the model actually performs well in all the centers. So with all this, uh, we think we can solve the, the problem of, uh, or at least ameliorate the problem of congested uh, endoscopy services. So without Miroplus, we were saying like one or, one or two percent of, uh, of, of, of 100, say a cohort of 100, would have gastric cancer. If we screen with our test, we expect to be able to still detect this one or two cancer while freeing 60% uh, of that endoscopy area, potentially for people that need it most, right? And uh, 
What is also important for our screening uh, purposes is this negative predictive value. That is the probability of you being sent home because some miraculous test said that you were a negative while actually having cancer. So that would be the most harmful situation. And we know that's 0.2%, uh, which, is, which is something that is well above what the guidelines for a test like this are. are. It's around 95% NPV that you actually need. And that's how we, in Miraculous, see the future of diagnostics. Uh, we pair an ide ideal biomarker that is sensitive enough, specific enough, and that circulates in blood so that you can uh, be tested in a minimal invasive way, and enabling technology that makes it possible for us to make a robust, repeatable, repeatable, and cheap test, and advanced data analytics that let us build models that are predictive enough and can be applied on real time on everybody. With this, we hope that we can get cost-effective, simple, and accurate detection for everybody on diseases like cancer. Thank you very much. So one of the questions that I had was you're using uh, the graph, uh, connect the graph database for helping people quickly figure out research papers that are relevant to what they're really interested in in terms of the genes in the lab. Um, but in that product that you finally have, which I think is a device that you can hopefully you know, give a small sample of blood and detect if you have cancer, if I understand right. Just as part of the product that ships within that, that isn't really using any machine learning or any predictive uh, analytics at that point in time. Because at that point in time, it's a pre-configured calculation sequence to run a bunch of tests and predict the value. Am I understanding this right? So, so you still have to, so you have your device, and your device is reading specific levels of the microRNAs that we have distilled in our predictive model, right? So this predictive model says, okay, there's these seven microRNAs that are important, and analyzes those levels to decide whether this is a cancer sample or it's not. So at the time that you get the test, you only apply that model. The model is in the cloud, so the, the, the device will send the data and get back. So we plan to launch this in 2018, uh, already approved by regulations. Next year will be the early access program with hospitals and uh, scientists we're already working with uh, in around a year from today. We don't know what's the price, but we can, I can tell you the cost today. Uh, still requires optimization, still requires logistics, still requires packaging, but our cost is around 10 to $15 per day. And then regarding the models, um, so I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that is. So it's, it's very standard machine learning in that we, uh, so we try very, well, not very many, like different models that are expected to perform well for different reasons, some of which are more parsimonious, some of which are much more complex. We embed all this in a nested cross-validation scheme in which we try to incorporate the model, uh, say the model selection part, within uh, the test, we optimize our parameters. So we, we have everything from like regular naturalistic regression, and running booster machines, SVMs, so all that you would think you have. Uh, there's that prior part, which is just like what is the hard prior. So if we know that some microRNA is associated with something that has comorbidity with gastric cancer, we might want to eliminate it before. Uh, and then we do our cross-validation, see what our expected, uh, in this case, area under the group is, and then we validate finally with our whole lot set. And that's, that's how the model is. But the only other thing is because for us, the more microRNAs that enter into the test, the more expensive our cartridge will get. We actually prime capacity in the model, so we want less microRNAs to be part of the panel. Just because, first of all, because in general that would be good practice, even though we don't have that many samples, but in, especially for us, because we want the test to stay cheap, everything else to be the same. Does that answer the question? Thank you.
Thank you. We will now um, go on with the next presentation. Thank you.